Avenue Church. Good morning, Avenue Church. All right. We're wait this morning. Hello, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael James. And I always consider it a privilege and an honor to be able to come and share the word with you this morning. And so, let's jump right in. I got a, a, quite a bit I want to share with you. We're just talking this morning. I just want to talk to you. Don't have any profound things to, to share, but just share some things in the word that I really got when I was going through it and, and, and looking at scripture and stuff and just want to share it with you and maybe it'll be a blessing to your life. So, uh, wait a minute, I'm missing something. Where's, where's Superman? Oh, there he is, Superman. I saw this and I really liked it, um, but just take a look at that. We'll come back to Superman in a little bit. But if I gave a title to this message or this sermon, I would call it Dangerous Joyous Call. So I want to talk to you this morning about the calling of God. That, that each and every one of us, God, has, God is calling all of us. That there's a calling on your life, just as there's a calling on my life. For the Christian, in a, in a sense, we, we experience several times in our lives where God is calling us to something. But it, 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 it starts with that first call. And that is God calling me, I can remember God calling me to himself when I was 17 years old. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I came to recognize that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. I realized that, that in and of myself, I couldn't help myself, and I needed to surrender myself to God. And I found God in the person of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is God, and he had broken into my reality for me. I mean, he did it for us, but he did it for me. And in the face of God calling me to himself, that's what I saw. I saw God calling my name, calling me to himself. And Jesus is that person who was my substitute. That my sins and my transgressions and all of my insecurities and all of my shortcomings, that Jesus came to, to stand and pay the penalty for all of those things. He's my substitute. And now when I put my faith in him, his life, his death, and his resurrection. I put on the righteousness of God. When God looks at me, he does not see a broken, insecure little boy, but he sees the righteousness of his son. And that's how I'm able to come before you today. That was the first call. But there have been others. I think about God calling me um, to marriage when I met my wife and we got married and even um, for myself and others might not have experienced this th that way but when I joined the military I joined the Coast Guard I felt the way God set those up it was just appalling that there, were, that there are times in our lives you know God sustains our lives he's always sustained our life providentially but there are extra ex times of extraordinary intervention supernatural occurrence where you distinctly feel like, you know what, wait, God is, God is really tugging on my heartstrings right now. God is really, really speaking to me. And, and I felt those times, several of those times um, over and over again in my life. And it doesn't, so this is not just something about for the Christian, for the seeker, but this is also for the believer. If you've been walking with Jesus for a lifetime, God is calling you. I mean, think about it. We're so glad that God is big enough and he's great enough that we can't get exhaust him or complete him or finish him like a book. You know, you can get tired of it and sit it down or you can complete it. But with God, you can spend four lifetimes and there will still be more. And God is calling you to go deeper. So when talking to you about calling, oh, that, there was something else I want to mention. You know, one, one of the reasons why I came to this, this message was because, as you guys know, many of you know, my wife and I answered the call to plant a church. And we're in the process of planning, of, of, of planning that, to plant core church next year. And so we've been wrestling with that, with the call and the plan. But also, I mean, it's just something that, as a, as a believer, we experience, not just in this, this area, but in all areas of our lives. And so, in talking to you guys about 
call of the call of God on your life. I wanted to give you some illustrations of what that looked like, looks like. And so I thought we could look at three people in the Bible, three occurrences where God has called someone. The first is Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet in the Old Testament. He prophesied, a lot, prophesied quite a bit about our Savior. And if we look to Isaiah, the sixth chapter and the first verse, we're going to go in scripture a lot today. Um, so if you have your Bibles and your phones, pull it out, keep it out. I'm going to read, a, read quite a bit of scripture. And um, we're going to look at, this is Isaiah being called to the office of prophet. And he has this vision. Let's see what the word of the Lord says. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Can you guys hear me? Okay. All my things looked up. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, this is Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am, I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. I just had to read all of this because it's just like, like wow, that's so powerful, right? I mean, so grandiose. We, we see God, you know, high and lifted up. We see him sitting on his throne. The big takeaway for me when I read this scripture is the holiness of God. Like it's palpable. You can feel it. He said, the scripture says that he, ha he has on his robe, and the train of his robe fills the temple. And the angels are flying, and they have to cover their eyes. And they're crying out, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And even the foundations of the place. The foundations of the place shake when he speaks because of his holiness. And all of this is not lost on Isaiah. He senses it. And he says, woe is me. That I'm unclean and I can't be here. He is aware of the chasm that is between the righteousness of God and his depravity. And he knows that there is no way in and of himself that he can bridge it. And then an angel of the Lord comes and touches his lips. And says some interesting things. He doesn't say that you're not dirty anymore. He says that your guilt is taken away. It has been atoned for. You're no longer guilty. Someone else has paid the penalty. And then the voice of the Lord, the God speaks, and he says, who will we send? Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I think something powerful happened to Isaiah. I think that two things collided for him. The grace and the mercy that he received and the holiness and righteousness of the person that was doing the ask, asking. Both of those things hit like this. And all the trembling and all the fear washed away. And in my, my, my scripture, ESV, there's an exclamation point when he says, here I am. And he says, send me. That's the way the call of God works. I tell you right now, I would be under the chairs in one of those classrooms in there, not standing up here before all of you guys, if it wasn't for the call of God. It's the grace and the mercy that he gave to a 17-year-old little boy. And it's his holiness and righteousness that says, you know what, it doesn't matter. Even if I get laughed at, I'm going to go out here, Lord. And I will speak for you. 
This is the call of God and what it looks like and how it moves over our life. That the one who is righteousness, righteous and holy is doing the asking. And he is also the one who has atoned for and saved us from our sins. So let's move on and look at the second illustration. And this is Samuel. Samuel is also a prophet. And we're also going to look at his call to the office of being a prophet. This is 1 Samuel, the third chapter, the first to the tenth verse. In this scripture, the story of Samuel, Samuel has some personal significance to me. His mother was barren. She couldn't have children. And she prayed to God and she said, Lord, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you. And he will serve you for all the days of his life. And when I first heard that, I really couldn't understand why would she give her kid, like why would she give her kid to God? And she did just that. When she had him, God answered her prayer, she had him, she weaned him, he was weaned from her breast. She took him to the temple, and he lived there and served and began training there. And, and I thought about this in reading the scripture, I was reminded of my mom who just not too long ago passed away. And I can remember distinctly being seven, eight, nine years old, when we were having family prayer and we're, I'm down on my knees at the side of the bed and she was praying for me and my brother. My mom was, um, come from, I come from a Pentecostal tradition so, you know, she had the olive oil out and she buttered us up real good. Laying <laughs> <laughs> hands on us. And, and, and I knew that my mom, because it was talked about, that she had trouble having children that would, she couldn't have kids. And she, with tears in her, tears in her eye, would often, eyes often pray for me and my brother. And she would lay hands on us and she would say, Lord, I pray for these boys. And you answered my prayer and you gave them to me. And so now I give them back to you. And I pray that you would use them, that they would serve you. And it's interesting to me that on the day that she breathed her, breathed her last breath, I was actually standing on this stage preaching his gospel to my church. So I think prayer, prayer does matter. And so the word of the Lord, 1 Samuel, the third chapter, the first to the tenth verse. And the word says, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim, so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. And Eli is the chief priest who Samuel served. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times. Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. And so began his calling, his work in ministry with the Lord. Like we see here God intervening in this boy's life. We see how the call of God works, how we might think that we're, we're headed in one direction, in one path, and then we hear the voice of God. One of the big takeaways I want to share with you is that God's call, it is general. Like there's the Bible, and we all can read it. Jesus was sent 
to the world, but I want you to know that God personally chose you. That he's big enough and he's great enough, despite all the faces that we see in here this morning, that to personally choose each and every one of us. That Jesus died personally for you. And that his call is personal. That it gets very personal. He's talking to you, Jennifer. He's talking to you, Matthew. He's talking to you, Tyrone. And he's talking to me, Mike. God chose you. The second takeaway that I want us to get from this, and there's so much that you could take from Samuel, from this, just from this passage. The second takeaway that I want you to think about is don't forget to answer. Don't forget to answer when he calls. And I know some people might be like, man, like I'm, I'm like I'm this whole thing calling God, calling me. I don't even really know. How could I make commitments? I don't know what this is. I'm trying to wrap my head around all of this. Samuel didn't make any big grandiose gestures of commitments to God. He just said, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. He recognized that same holiness and righteousness back in Isaiah. And he said, Lord, I'm listening. What an act of faith. I'm so glad that the call of God is something that happens objectively for me. Like I get up here and I'm preaching, I'm talking this, I'm talking about this stuff, that this is not a work of something that I do in and of myself, but it's something that God does. That right now, God is working on the hearts and minds and ears of all of us. And he's calling us to himself. Don't forget to respond. And you don't have to know everything. If we just sit up and say, Lord, I hear you. I know something is happening. I don't really understand all that's going on, but Lord, speak to me. And make it plain. Amen? Amen? And so we go to the next illustration. Showing you, just giving you a little bit of illustration of what does the call of God look like. And we turn to Acts 13. First, verse 1, to 3. Now, first when I started off, I started out like in the heavenlies, right? And that was really grandiose. And then we kind of came down to earth a little bit with that second one, Samuel, you know. But he, but still, Samuel was like, I mean, pretty much, he was audibly hearing the voice of God. That's why he went to, to, to Eli, right? So we're going to bring it more, even more down to earth here. And this is the way that, I mean, I think that when God calls you, it's a supernatural work. But I think most often this is the way we experience God's call. And this is... Acts 13, 1 through 3. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. I love this scripture because we actually get to see in the, in the local church the outworking of, Math, of Matthew 28, the Great Commission. We see them, this church that's making disciples, sending others out to go and make disciples. And the scripture starts off talking about the diversity of gifts in the body some to be prophets and some to be teachers. And this scripture, the support, that it goes just beyond ministry gifts, but that there are gifts, there are spiritual gifts, and gifts of personality, and culture, and nationality, in the body of Christ. Barnabas and Saul weren't just picked randomly. The Holy Spirit didn't say, you know, you got some prophets and teachers, so just, I need a couple, could you send me a few? He says, I want Barnabas, and I want Saul. And so the thing that I want to share with you from this scripture 
is that God has equipped you that you personally are uniquely qualified for what he's called you to do. He did not want Jerome. He did not want Lisa. He did not want Christina. Not for this. He has called you. And he has given you everything that you need for the thing that stands before you. I'm going to say that again. He lives in you. The God who sits high and looks low. He who created the foundation of the world. He lives in you. And therefore, everything that you need for the very thing that he's called you to, it's already in you. Amen? The second thing that I want us to consider when we look at this verse is that the calling of God was to serve in community. Like, like Barnabas and, and Saul they didn't just say, hey, hey guys, listen, you know, the Lord's calling us to head out and we're going to be going to the Ephesians and we're going to go to Syria and all these other places. Like, that's not what happened. The church didn't come to them. Could you imagine the church come and the church like comes to somebody and say, hey, listen, we need to plan a new church, so we need you to move to Miami, okay? That's not the way it occurred. It was done in community that, 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 that they were all on one accord and think about that. I mean, think about how hard it is for, for us to, to agree on anything. Just consider politics for a second. And they all agreed and knew that, that someone was to be sent and who it was to be sent. And so my word to you is, is that if you think you know what God is calling you to, and you haven't sat down with anybody in the fellowship, in the body of Christ, and talked to them about it, I'm not going to say that you don't know what God's calling you to, because I'm, 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 I believe that we're the best arbiter of what God is doing in our lives. But I will tell you, so I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong, but I'm not going to tell you you're right. Either. That God's process and his plan for discerning his will is in community. That he has given us one another as a help. That I don't have to just decide these things in and of myself, but that I can affirm it with one another. And so we, we can do this in community. And then the third thing that I want us to consider as we think about God's call on our lives is the practice of spiritual discipline. Like the scripture starts out, they, they were worshiping and they were fasting and they were praying. And when we talk about spiritual discipline, listen, it's not like some legalistic thing you do to get favor with God. What spiritual disciplines are, they are the mediums or the modes, the things that we do to spend time and commune with God. When we pray, we're spending time communing with Him and with one another. When we worship, when we fast, and even when we rest. Did anybody know that? Spiritual resting is a, is a spiritual discipline. Like we, you would think that we would all get A's in that particular area, but we all struggle, right? We struggle to stop and to rest and to trust God. And so spiritual discipline is, needs to be a part of us coming to the answer of this call, like oftentimes we get an idea in our head and we're like, oh, God told me, and we're, we're headed off. And we couldn't even find on a calendar the last time we spent in some, some significant time in prayer to the Lord. This isn't an indictment against us. The spiritual discipline, you know, we don't like that word, but it is for us. And it's for us to do individually, and it's for us to do and community together. Y'all receive that? And so this is what the call of God looks like. I hope this gives you a, a better illustration of what it looks like when God's calling you, that you see his holiness and his righteousness, that we will be mindful of his grace and his mercy, that we know his call is personal, and that we would answer and respond even if it's just Lord speaking. That we know that we're equipped for whatever it is that God has called us to. 
and he's not giving you a community of people. You don't have to just discern this in and of yourself. And we can commune with him and be sure of what he's calling us to. And so the calling is to the fulfillment of God's mission. Yes, we're called for the fulfillment of God's mission. And so what we saw in Acts 13 with Barnabas and Saul, we saw the outworking of Matthew 28, the Great Commission where Jesus commissions us to make disciples of all nations. But that's not the mission of God. And the thing that God is calling us to, the thing that God is calling us to is ultimately the mission of God. The Great Commission is God's mission for man. It's our role that he has given us to play in his sovereignty in the mission of God. But that's not the mission of God. And we see the fulfillment of God's mission in Revelations, the 21st verse, 21st chapter, I'm sorry, and the first to the seventh verse. So when we think about God's mission, as we read this, we see the fulfillment and the culmination of everything that God has intended in redemptive history. Revelations 21, verse 1, and this is the Apostle John and his vision. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who, who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have his disheritance, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. You know, many believers don't even know that's in the Bible. They might not have never read that. And often people think that God is calling them to like this rice, this life of like holy work, or no, holy living of just doing the right thing and the right choice. And that is a part of the Christian faith. But ultimately, God has called us to be with him. This is the purpose of redemptive history, that he chose us. And he said, the great joy of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I'm going to share that, and I'm going to share it with humanity. And we read here, he says, that God, he says, that I will be their God, and they will be my people. In all pain, in all tears, in all crying, in all sadness, it will be gone. That God's mission is about social and global transformation. That we read in these scriptures that there is a new earth. That God's mission is maybe bigger than we even ever imagined. And I think it's really important as we do fulfill our role in God's mission that we are mindful of his overall mission, God's overall mission. What we just read, that's not something that we can do. Like God has to fulfill that mission. God has to do that. He has to complete that. But when I'm mindful of what the greater scope of this mission is, it helps to refocus me as I consider the call of God. <clears throat> Our focus is on seekers. People come into faith to Christ and converts, yes, that's a big part of the Great Commission. It's on discipleship. It really is. But it's on more than that. 
And I have some, some of my scholars, some quotes for some of my scholars that point us in that direction. Timothy Keller. Let me get that. Is that up? Yeah. Okay. I can't see it. I'm thinking it's going to be here, but it's over here. Okay. So um, Timothy Keller said that the gospel is the good news that God has come to rescue and renew all of creation through the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Scott McKnight, and if anybody doesn't know, Timothy Keller is the pastor of Redeemer Church in New York. Um, look him up, great author. And Scott McKnight, a Christian scholar, and he says that the gospel is the work of God to restore humans to union with God and communion with others in the context of a community for the good of others in the world. And that's big, right? That means it's not just about my salvation. It's not even just about my and your salvation. But we're to establish and have a community and a fellowship that affects our world, our the area and community that we influence. That we're not just even, so it's not even just about our community. Like, we're not just supposed to get together and, and kick it. Like, okay, it's great. Like, we have this fellowship and we're kicking it. Like, it's, it's about more than that because our fellowship should affect the world around us. And then David Bosch says, David Bosch says that the mission of God is more and different from recruitment to our brand of religion. It is the alerting people to the universal reign of God through Christ. That that, so when we think about our role that we play in God's mission, that, that God, God has for us to be a signpost to the world, to be a signpost to the world that his reign and his rule is true and real even right now. Even right now, in this moment. And so understanding this bigger scope of God's mission, it refocuses us not just on conversions and not just on discipleship, but also on being a light to the world that his reign and rule is true. And I believe that the word of God says that this is best done with our lives. And so this is our gospel. This will be our gospel demonstration. This will be our gospel demonstration. You know, when I was a young kid, um, I grew up here in South Florida, and so I could be outside and at my house playing and look right across the street, and it would be raining at my neighbor's house. Like I could just watch the I could watch the clouds slowly come make their way over time. That's the way it is down here, and I think that's what God's in a way called us to be to the world, not not a storm cloud but rays of sunshine and light of his reign and rule. That our fellowship, that, the, that, that our very fellowship, that the very union that is the Avenue Church, that we would be the family of God, that we would be that people that we read about a moment ago in Revelations 21, that we would be that signpost to the world, this light, this sunlight in a fallen world, and the world will look at this fellowship and say, my God, like that could not come about. That has to be a miracle. It has to be a supernatural occurrence that has unified them and brought them together in love and unity and friendship in this way. What does that family look like? And before I say that, I just want to say this. And then we, we be in that family, we get to invite people, seekers, we get to invite people into it. That as we do the mission of God, and we're evangelizing, we're doing our hospitality, we're doing our discipleship, all of these things are great, all of them are important. I love to go to a church event, I love to go to a program. But isn't it great when we can invite people into the party that is our fellowship that's already going on? And that is the thing, that is the thing that will give us an exponential increase in effectiveness in our mission. So what does this family look like? Well, the family of God, it looks like this. So like everywhere else, a person's worth is based on what they can do. But in the family of God, you do not need to be good at anything to have value. 
In the family of God, people who have reason to boast by the world's standards, the rich, the handsome and beautiful, the talented, those in authority and the educated, use these gifts to serve others, enrich the fellowship, and they do not lord it over others. In the family of God, acceptance and belonging are free of charge. In God's family, conflict is not seen as something to avoid. When it arises, conflict is seen as an opportunity, something to be resolved and an opportunity to grow closer to one another. And so we deal with our conflict and we talk about our problems. Rather than gossiping about someone, we actually go straight to the person. Can you imagine this? A community and fellowship where we go straight to the person. And we, and we talk about whatever the issue is, and we do it in community. The family of God is a people where Republicans and Democrats, blacks and whites, and other groups traditionally in conflict talk about their, their offense and our differences openly and often learning from one another's point of view. How many of us, this is a big thing, but what would it look like for us after the election to have gone and sat down with another believer who had voted for the opposite person over a, and to sit down and over a cup of coffee have a conversation so that we can understand why they voted for the person they voted for. Like I said, God's mission is not just about my salvation, but it's about social and global transformation. And that we can exercise it and be an example of it right now to the world. Now I know what you're thinking. Like Mike, that sounds good. And, and you're probably thinking, okay, so now I get it. This is why it's called the dangerous cross, call, right? Because of the impossibility of creating a fellowship or a community like this. And the impossibility largely stems from the fact that like, I mean, who wants, like that sounds good on paper. I mean, I, I have nothing against all of that. But really, who wants to do that? I mean, who, who wants to go to work and the person who is not, they're not equipped to do that, their job, and they got, the, they got the job, but they're not equipped to do it, that you're seeing value and respect and appreciation for this person. I mean, we want to choose our friends, right? This thing about like acceptance and belonging, it's free of charge, that we accept whoever comes. Some people are annoying, right? Some people we perceive to be weird. It's a dangerous calling because we realize that God may be calling me to be and to live in a place that I may just not want to go. I mean, we talk about the orphans and the widows, and some of us might want to be like, well, Pastor, you know what? I don't have any room in my house for orphans. I don't have any room for widows. Maybe we just don't want to. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning that that's okay. Because we're in good company. Because our Savior was there, and even the Apostle Paul was there. We could go to the next next slide. So we see here in this verse we're about to read, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's about to go to the cross. And in Matthew, the 26th chapter and the 36th verse, the word says, and going a little farther, he, Jesus, fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That Jesus had a lesser want. That he had a lesser want. There was a greater want, and he said in the end, Lord God, I will do what you've called me to do. But listen, if I don't have to be crucified, like, is there something, is there another option? And then we see in, in John, the 21st chapter, in the, 16th, the 18th verse, 
This is, a, this is uh, Peter talking to Jesus. This is after the crucifixion. Jesus has, um, the this is after the crucifixion and resurrection. Jesus has just talked to Peter about his denial of him. And this 20, the 21st chapter, the 18th verse, Jesus says to Peter, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted to. Wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Now we know definitely that Peter spent the last years of his life in prison. We believe he was martyred for the work for the sake of Christ. And Jesus says right here that Peter, that was not where he wanted to be. I mean, Peter even said in other scripture, Peter said, I really want to go home to be with the Lord, but I believe it's God's will that I remain alive for the sake of the gospel, and that is what, what it will be. And so we see that there could be a conflict with the call of God. That on the one hand, God is calling us, and yes, I know he rescued me, and I know he's holy and righteous, but there's other things that I want. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not here to tell you that, you know what, you need to be like Jesus and make that right choice. Choose the greater thing and the right thing. White knuckle it, grip your hands tight, and just do the choose God and choose his will and choose his purpose. I'm not here to tell you that because the truth of the matter is, is that you can't. You would not choose God and his will. You would not affirm the God's call, and I would not in and of ourselves. But I'm here to tell you to rest easy because you will choose rightly, and you will because our Savior has. And we saw him in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had these two wants, but one became the lesser and the other became the greater. And he who made that choice lives in your heart. And so instead of worrying about the call of God and the telling of God on your heart, you can rest easy about it today. You can trust God's work in your heart even right now. You can go to him and talk to him and say, Lord, speak. I want to listen. I'm not afraid of what you're about to tell me because I know that you're working in my heart. You can sit down with your brother and sister in Christ and you can share with them the move of God that is going on in your life. This is what God is telling me. This is how God is leading me. Can we go to Superman? And so it is a dangerous calling. It's dangerous because we don't get to be the hero. Often when we see Superman in action, we're kind of thinking of ourselves, right? And we're emboldened because of his great power and awesomeness. But the truth is, is that in this picture, we're Lois Lane. And we laugh. But you know what? In our society, we have battered and bruised womanhood so much so that we've compartmentalized the, the purpose and call of the church, its role, and what God has called us to do. And we compartmentalize it into just an area of our lives, and we spend the rest of it trying to be Superman. But the truth is that God has given us an awesome and beautiful role to play in redemptive history. But it's a hard pill to swallow that we don't get to be the hero. Now I know many of you are probably saying, okay, now you've talked a whole lot about how this calling is dangerous. Like, where's the good stuff? Like, where's the good part of this? It is also a joyous calling. And it's a joyous calling because God call illuminates all of your life, even the mundane. Like there are certain parts and certain things that you do and you would say, this is great, 
I built this, I did this. But the call of God says, no, 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 not just the quote unquote great things about your life are awesome, but all of your life is awesome. And if we think about Lois Lane, I mean, really, she lived a charmed life full of adventure and excitement and entertainment. And she was a blessing even to others. Now, I don't know if some of you probably didn't read the comic books. I was a comic book reader, so, so I, I, I know this. But, but she was a blessing to, even to others. And that God is calling us not to just focus, not to just focus and be proud of and thankful for the good works of conversions and the good works of discipleship, but God is calling us to be the family of God that he has empowered us to be. And this is great news for us. This is a part of the joy because it means that all of your life had matters. That all of your life has eternal significance. That all of your life glorifies God. Your talents, your work, and even your sleep. I love to watch my son sleep. I love to watch Uriah sleep. I love to watch Uriah and Jordan, my daughter. I love to watch them play, and my heart is grieved when they're fighting. Why? Because they represent me. They're part of me. And in the same way that they represent me, in a in similar way, we represent God. And he loves to watch you and see you be you. He loves our fellowship. He loves the laughter. He loves the fun times and the good times. And he even loves your sleep. He even loves your play. And he even loves your work. God's call is joyous because he is bringing meaning and purpose to every aspect of your existence. Amen? Amen. And so in closing, just have um, just a couple more things I want to share then I'm going to close up. So if you could go to John, the 17th chapter, in the 20th to the 23rd verse. And this is Jesus they call this, John 17, the high priestly prayer. It is my favorite chapter in the Bible. And it is a prayer of our Savior. I mean, think about it. Like, you gotta, if you haven't read this, you gotta check it out. If you read it, like me, let's read it again. Because we actually get to see God pray. This is his prayer. At the 20th to the 23rd verse, Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you love me. These, these verses, for me, personifies the call of God on my heart to plant for church. <laughs> That the glory of God that empowers us to make the disciples, to be disciple makers, to make the disciples of our mission, that that glory would emanate in and through our unity, our family, and our friendship. That we will be a light to the city of Lake Worth to the degree that we are one. Just as God, Jesus, who is in our hearts, is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. I've had some time to think about because the question's been asked of me in preparation and assessment 
I, you go through assessment process for planning a church, and, and the question's been asked, who has the Lord called for a church to? And, you know, I thought about it. I'm like, well, really, like everybody, like we're not turning anybody away. You know, the rich, the poor, the, the all ethnicities and cultures. And then I felt like the Holy Spirit put this on my heart and said, you know, this, everybody doesn't fall in this block. And the Lord said, I'm sending you the disaffected, the lonely, the people who feel unaccepted and those looking for belonging. I'm talking about the person who has no family, the adult orphan, the widow, or even the person who has family, but they have a desire to expand their family. And they said, man, this is too good just to keep to myself, but I gotta let others in. It was asked of me, what what would core church, like what is the compelling thing for, about core church? And I think that, I, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things, when you talk about church planning, I mean, the budget's gonna be low. There's a lot of things we're not gonna have. There probably won't be a great edifice, and you know, we, we got great plans for good worship and music that might not be good preaching. I mean, you decide. But the thing the Holy Spirit, God promised, the thing that the Lord promised me is the Lord said, Michael, I'm sending you to make a family. I'm sending you to be a signpost that I'm real and that my love is real and that my glory is here for my people and that you and others will gather together and you will be a signpost, that your fellowship and your relationship will be a signpost that relationship with God is possible. And the other great thing I think the Lord, the Holy Spirit has promised is that he said, and I will give you all meaning and purpose that goes beyond the program or an event or just a service, but meaning and purpose in all of your life, in your everyday life. And so we have been asking for prayer for Core Church, and we're going to be continuing to do that, and continuing to ask you to pray with us. And now I'm asking for you to pray and ask God if God's calling you to join this mission. I ask you to pray that prayer and talk to God about it. Suss that out, that calling with friends and family in the body of Christ, that you would discern what God's will is. We would love to have you join us. We ask that you will continue to keep praying for us. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, Lord God, I thank you, Lord God. I thank you for meaning and purpose. I thank you for meaning and purpose that transcends, it, sin, it transcends my wants and my everyday desires, of Lord God. It's something that would get me, someone who is really insecure, to come up on this stage. It transcends things so much that we would even be willing to give our lives. But I'm also thankful for how, man, Lord, I'm so thankful for, you show yourself to be so worthy of our worship. I'm thankful that in giving ourselves to you, we don't lose anything, but that we get the very things that we always wanted. We thank you and we praise your name. Amen. Amen.